We should probably do some sort of introduction. Like, hi, everybody. I'm Patricia. Hi, I'm Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and we're weird as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you probably should, I guess. So. Yeah. Because someday we might be famous. <laughs> 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 okay. So. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Alrighty. Are you excited for this this topic? I don't know. <laughs> you don't tell me what the hell the topics are, so that's I have when, nothing to I, be excited about because I don't know what the fuck it is. That's because when I do tell you what the topics are, you just sit there while I'm reading and you don't say anything. Yeah, well, I have a hard time talking sometimes. Well, sometimes it's just because the story is so compelling, you just want me to You're tell just, you the story. Some, cover, some of them you just cover everything and it's like you don't have any questions because you've already... Covered everything. Well, yeah, like the last one, the L8 blimp. With... Yeah, you pretty much was pretty well detailed on everything on that one. Well, it's because I got the information from a military website and they covered everything. I mean, I'm surprised we didn't have a list of all the toiletries they used while they were in, in the air. <laughs> Honestly. This week, we're covering time slips. One in particular, but I've got some anecdotal ones to share as well, but... One juicy good one. One one really, really interesting one. Um, And just a bunch of really interesting ones. But one that's really well known and it's really well documented. And it's it provides compelling evidence. So you know what a time slip is. Yeah. So essentially it's um, somebody who finds themselves in an environment that doesn't match what their modern expectation would be. So there's tons of stories. If you go on the web and search time slips, there's stories about people walking into shops and finding themselves in something that's maybe 200 years out of date. Um, there was this great story that I read about um, these two couples that were friends that were traveling in France, um, which still blows me away because in America, it's like a third of the continent is just America. Whereas you go to Europe and you drive 15 minutes and you're in France or Italy or Switzerland and, you know, we drive 16 hours and you've made it to South Dakota. Yeah. You're still in the U.S. Um, so I th I find that fascinating anyway. But um, so these two couples, they go to um, a hotel in France and they need a room for the night. And they're amazed because these are incredibly cheap rooms. I mean, it's like pennies for the for the evening, which they're excited about, although it's kind of primitive. There's no glass in the windows. It's the summer, so they weren't like too stressed out about it. But um, they pay their money. They go down the next morning. They have their breakfast, which is like a really hearty country breakfast. And they decide that on their way back that they want to stay in the same place because that was cheap. Like, like real cheap. Normally they'd pay, you know, hundreds of dollars for a room at the last minute. And they got it for, you know, a couple of bucks. Um, but when they come back, it's gone. The whole building is gone. There's nothing there. And they do a little research and they find out that there hadn't been an inn there for over 100 years. Mm-hmm. But they did notice that, you know, everything was primitive, that the people were wearing clothes that were really out of date, like really, really out of date, um, that their French was odd. They spoke it well enough. They, they spoke French and they, they could understand what the people were saying, but it was really odd. So imagine if you met somebody from 18th century America, you'd probably have a really difficult time understanding one another. Yeah, they talked pretty weird back then. Well, language evolves. Yeah. So stories like that, I think, are fascinating. Um, there's a guy who went into, his wife went into a bookstore. He went into a pub to get a drink <laughs> because, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, but, some women spend a lot of time in, in uh, book places. It's not hoarding <laughs> books. It's a library. I'm just saying he had a lot of time, probably. He had some time to kill. <laughs> um, but when he walked in, um, he noted that there were no TVs on the wall. Um, people kind of looked at him strangely. Their clothing was also out of date, and the beer was way cheap. But he had a good time, had his drink, 
came out, found his wife. Um, and he told her, you know, let's go in here. Let's go get some lunch now that you're done buying every book in the store. Um, <laughs> and when he turned around and went back, the pub wasn't there anymore. And it was it was a different kind of shop. So lots of interesting stories like that. People turning down alleyways and finding themselves on cobbled streets that are oddly silent. So this one is a lot more involved, a lot more involved. And it's the story. It's it's officially known as the Moberly Jordan incident. And it's really, really well known. And like I said, it's one of the most compelling um, pieces of evidence for the idea of inadvertent time travel. It's too bad any of actually like got it on video when they went into one of those places. Well, this one happened in 1901, so that wouldn't have been yeah. possible. And what's really, really um, interesting about this is these two ladies that experienced this were both incredibly well-educated professors. So these were not teenage girls prone to flights of fancy. These are not people who would have maybe seen you know, a costumed event and mistaken it for something else. Yeah. You know, just like me, if I ended up, you know, if, if I took a nap in the car and woke up at Ren Fair, I'd probably think what the fuck just happened? Except, you know, that sort of thing didn't happen in the United States. So I would have thought something was up, but I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I wouldn't have. I'm stupid. When I, <laughs> I'm stupid when I first wake up. So, um, so a little bit of background. Um, so like I said, this is called the Moberly Jourdain incident. And that would be Charlotte Ann Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. You don't have to remember those names. It's fine. I'm not going to. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Charlotte Moberly was born in 1846. One of 15 children. Damn. Mommy but was busy. They yeah. Mommy and Daddy were busy. Oh, please. Daddy was busy for 15 <laughs> minutes. Mommy was busy for the latter part of her life. It doesn't take long to make a child for men. <laughs> yeah. And then you guys go off and do your thing. Especially in 1846. You know mom was doing 99.9% .9 of the child care. Yep, he was probably at work 90% of the time. And 15 kids? That means she was raising kids for probably the better part of 50 years. Yeah. That woman needs a fucking medal is what I'll she pass. needs. Yeah, you've only been at it for 21 years and you're already tired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, she came from a professional background. Her dad was George Moberly and he was the headmaster of Winchester College. So well-educated guy. Um, and later the Bishop of Salisbury. Ooh. Which, you know, with 15 kids, hopefully it came with a good paycheck. Um, in 1886, she became the first principal of a hall of residence for young women at St. Hugh's College in Oxford. So you don't get that way just because you're cute and you show up for the, the job. Yeah. She was a smart, disciplined, respectful, respectable woman. Um. So it became apparent that she needed somebody to help run the college. And that's where Jourdain comes into our story. She was born in 1863. And this is Eleanor Jourdain, the other person. Um, she was the eldest of 10 children. So obviously before TV was invented, people were entertaining themselves in other ways. Um, her father was the Reverend Francis Jourdain, the vicar of Ashburn in Derbyshire. And she was the sister of the art historian Margaret Jourdain and the sister of mathematician Philip Jourdain. So these two ladies come from really well-educated families of thinkers. She was also the author of several textbooks. She ran a school of her own. And she became the vice principal of St. Hugh's College after all of this came down. So obviously smart ladies. Yeah. So... As I said, um, Ms. Moberly um, decided she needed help. It became apparent that she wasn't going to be able to do this huge job all by herself. Um, so Jourdain was hired. And they decided that to get to know each other better, they would take a little trip, a little road trip, you know, spend some time together, chat, see what they had in common, where maybe there was room for improvement in their relationship. Um, and they decided to go to Versailles because... You can get, even in 1901, from England to France fairly easily. Again, that blows my mind. 
I'm a stupid, filthy American, apparently, because that's They're small well, and insignificant compared to us. <laughs> Joking. Everybody in Europe, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> Well, it's not just that they're <laughs> small. It's because, you know, Europe, all of those independent countries, and then, you know, North America, three countries. Yep. And we're all huge. Massive. Massive countries. Yeah. But in Europe, you can, well, you can't drive from England to France. Because there's this whole English Channel thing in the way. But, you know, take a boat, then you can drive. And I'm going to assume that's exactly what they did. Um, so they they recounted their story in this way. And I'm going to quote from some of these other sources because I think they probably put the point out there. And I want to make sure that I don't miss any, um, any important points. So on the 10th of August, 1901, they went, they crossed the channel and then they took a train to Versailles. They remembered that they th- didn't think much of the palace after touring it because... In 1901, they probably hadn't restored it to its lavish greatness. But, you know, these are also, you know, academics academics tend to be a lot more difficult to impress with these things than bumpkins like us. I would probably go to Versailles and say, wow, a well-educated woman from Oxford is probably like, eh. it's a big building. Yay. Look, Costco for the French. Um so they decided to walk through the gardens um, to the Petit Trianon. Um, a- but um, after reaching the Petit Trianon, um, I don't remember what Trianon means. Um, Petit means small. After they reached the Grand Trianon, which is the big Trianon, um, <laughs> they found that the Petit Trianon was closed. Um, they recollected traveling with a Baedeker guidebook. and But they did become lost on the grounds because apparently the guidebook was um, not fabulous and they missed a turn. So the grounds of Versailles are pretty large. And if you get off into sort of the park area, apparently it can be fairly confusing. Um, So I'm going to try to pronounce this. (laughs) And every French speaker who listens to our podcast is going to immediately unfollow us. Um, so, Allée des Deux Trianons. So, the Alley of the Two Trianons. And I don't remember what Trianons means. Um, they entered a lane where they missed their destination. So, that was the missed turn. Um, Moberly reported that she saw a woman shaking a white cloth out of a window. So, if you imagine somebody, you know, with laundry or shaking a rug or something out a window to get the dust and dirt and whatever out of it. Um, well, Jourdain said that she noticed an old deserted farmhouse outside of which was an old plow, which they thought was just set dressing because, you know, obviously you set things up for the tourists to come in and feel like they've had an experience. Yeah, lots of them do that. Yeah. Um, at this point, however, they said that even though it was a clear, sunny day, they started to have this feeling of dread and oppression that came over them. So they weren't enjoying themselves. They weren't having a good time. They were feeling like this is not someplace they wanted to be. Um, immediately after that, they saw men who they thought looked like the palace gardeners. Um, and so they asked them, you know, how do I get where I'm going to be, where I need to be? And they told them to keep moving straight on. So they mobilely described the men as dignified officials dressed in long grayish green coats with small three cornered hats. Again, probably set dressing, right? Um, Jordan recalled that she noticed a cottage and there was a woman holding out a jug to a girl in the doorway. Um, she described it like a living picture, like something that you would have seen somebody paint and, you know, you know, this when you go into the art museum and you see pictures of daily life from the 1600s and the 1800s yeah. and things like that. Um, much like something she said, um, she would have seen at Madame Tussauds. Moberly didn't see the cottage, but she remembered feeling the atmosphere change. She wrote that everything, and I'm quoting her, Everything suddenly looked unnatural and therefore unpleasant. Even the trees seemed to become flat and lifeless, like woodworked in tapestry. 
there were no effects of light and shade and no wind to stir the trees. They each reported each re reaching the end of edge of the wood close to the temper temple de l'amour. De l'amour. The temple of love. And coming across <laughs> a man seated be beside a little garden kiosk wearing a cloak and a large sa shady hat. According to Moberly, he was repulsive in his appearance. His expression was angry. His complexion was dark and pockmarked. He was not at all welcoming. And um, Jourdain noted that this hideous man slowly turned his face and which was marked by marked by smallpox and scowled at the women. She felt felt that his um, although he was obviously unhappy for people to be there, he didn't appear to actually see them, though they were standing right in front of him. Um, she felt that he was repugnant and was in a hurry to go past him. They said that they saw another man with him, whom they described as tall, with large dark eyes and crisp curling black hair under a large sombrero-type hat. He came up to them and showed them the way to the Petit Trianon, which, remember, was supposed to be closed. It wasn't available to the public. When they got there, Moberly said that she noticed a lady sketching on the grass who looked at them as they crossed the bridge to reach the gardens in the front of the palace. She described the lady as wearing a light summer dress and a shady white hat with much fair hair. Moberly reported that she thought this was a tourist at first, but the dress appeared to be quite old fashioned. She was, she came in later years to believe that this woman was Marie Antoinette. But even though the woman was sitting out in front of them with a large white hat, which would have been quite noticeable, Moberly saw her and Jourdain did not, which I thought was odd. Strange. So at their return to the palace, they both reported they were directed round to the entrance and joined a party of other visitors. They said that after they toured the rest of the house, they had tea at the hotel before returning to Jourdain's apartments. So all of this happened, and then suddenly they just stepped back into 1901. Because yeah, they wouldn't be doing tours if it was back then. No, not at all. People like them would not have been welcomed onto the grounds because Marie Antoinette would have been beheaded um, during the French Revolution, which would have been in the latter part of the 18th century. So that's more than 100 years before these ladies toured the grounds of Versailles. And so, no, peasants would not have been wandering about. Um, it is worth noting that... Um, Moberly said when the woman saw them, the, the woman sketching them, she looked quite surprised to see them, but didn't pr protest their presence. So one would think that if the Queen of France saw you wandering about in her gardens, she would have spoken up. Yeah, I don't think it was probably who they thought it was, but who knows what the word jit. Well, according to the two women, they didn't chat about the incident and it was actually over quite quickly i mean the story makes it feel like it's going on for quite a while but it only took as long for them as it took for them to get down the path to back to the palace which would have been just a few minutes and neither one mentioned the incident to one another until about a week after leaving versailles and then in a letter to her sister she told her told her about the trip and started writing about the afternoon of the incident she asked Jourdain if she thought the Petit Trianon was haunted, and J Jourdain told her later that she thought it, maybe it was. Maybe they just saw ghosts. Although that doesn't explain why the background and the trees looked the way they did, why the wind stopped, why suddenly the noises of modern living stopped, which they 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 reported. It also doesn't necessarily mean... Um, make any sense as to why um, the atmosphere would have become so dark and so oppressive. Yeah, the whole thing's kind of weird, but you'd think they'd, if it's so weird, you'd, you'd ask questions of people and say, 
you know, if you thought you were in a different time, ask them, you know, what date it is or something. Yeah, and that's what I would be doing is going up to somebody and saying, okay, what's what day is this? Is this just, are you guys just dressed like this or is this, when is this or something? That would have been, well, my we'll question would have been, you know, somebody. Is, is this a renaissance fair? Is this a, you know, cosplay? Are you having a festival? What's going on here? Um, they did not do these things. Um, both of them thought they were experiencing the incident by themselves. So once they got back to Oxford, um, they waited a few weeks. Obviously, they were a little shaken by it. Um, then they wrote down their account of the incident separately and then compared notes. Um, and then being the academics that they were, they decided to hit the books. Remember, they're at Oxford, so they've got access to quite a lot of information. Um, so they decided to write separate accounts of what happened and research the history of the Trianon. The, they thought they might have seen events that took place on the 10th of August, 1792, six weeks before the abolition of the French mar monarchy, when t the Tuileries Palace in Paris was besieged and the King's Swiss Guards were massacred. So six weeks before everything got real scary in France, if you were rich. So imagine if they would have been at that time, then they definitely know something was wrong. Yeah. I mean, and what happens if you get stuck in a time slip and you they start shooting back. cannon fire? Do you not come back? Or you, or if you get lost and you get too far into it and then you never get back out. Yeah. I mean, I think about, you know, one of my favorite books, it, book series is Diana Gabaldon's Outlander series. And I think about the fairy stones and I love how she sort of intertwined this whole legend of these, these standing stones with her fictional account of this, of this British doctor. But, um, but it does make me wonder if these places do exist and it's capable for you to step out of your own time. Think about the people who just go vanish, who, who just vanish into thin air. You know, each one of them said that they came back and it was gone. So if they came back and it was gone, what if they were in it when it went? Well, and that's the thing. They visited Versailles several times after this and visited the gardens of Versailles many times. And they never experienced the same thing again. So they, just, they were convinced that it was a haunting and not a time slip. But... Um, and they, they both did obviously say that they experienced other paranormal accounts, but this was the one that they shared together. So I don't know, to me, it's really interesting. And especially because these women are, um, really, really intelligent ladies, although they do kind of discredit themselves later on because, um, you know, Moberly claims to have seen, um, an apparition of the Roman emperor Constantine in the Louvre in 1914. Why Constantine would be in Paris, I don't know. Um, Jourdain was convinced during World War II, or World War I, rather, um, that there was a German spy hiding in the college. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I would uh, take their stories very seriously. So, and, and that's part of the thing. I mean, if they did experience something extraordinary, then, you know, their their reputations up to this point and... You know, obvious, their obvious intellectual prowess should be taken into account. Just because maybe they got a little loopy later on in life doesn't mean that what they say happened didn't happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, in 1965, Philippe Julien, Philippe Julien, excuse me, it's French, um, Philippe. Um, wrote a biography of Robert de Montesquieu. At the time of Moberly and Jourdain's excursion to Versailles, Montesquieu lived nearby. And I'm probably pronouncing his name incorrectly, but, you know, whatever. Oh, wow. um, he reportedly gave really wild, lavish parties. So he would have people who showed up in costume. He'd have really, you know, vast, expansive sets. Um, and he, he would basically, he was just a crazy party guy who likes to entertain. And um, Julian believes that they stumbled into one of his parties and that's why the trees look like wood and why people were wearing period clothes. But it would be obvious if it was a party. People well, wouldn't be acting like that at a party. 
Well, you know what? We grew up in the 80s where a rager meant alcohol in the woods. Um, this could be like a cosplay adventure. Yeah. I don't know. Like Maybe people just like to get dressed up and do funny things. But so, but, you know, as compelling as the Moberly Jourdain in- incident is to me, because the people that they interacted with, I don't know. It's interesting to me because they experienced this independently and because these are such intelligent, well-respected women, why would they make up a story like this? But with the exception of the lady who was sketching, nobody seemed that put out by them being there. Which, if I saw something, even in 1901, the the mode of dress for women in 1901 was Ooh. very different. Yeah, you would be scandalous dressed like you oh, are yeah, you could now. See your ankles, man. Yeah. Well, in 1901, if I showed up dressed, you know, like this, and for you know, for the benefit of our audience, I'm wearing an oversized flannel shirt and a pair of jeans. If I showed up in Versailles. In 1901, dressed like this, people would be giving me some serious looks. My short hair. (gasps) Scandalous. (laughs) Um, So to me, it is interesting and it is compelling. But also the fact that people didn't really react to seeing them there makes me wonder, "Mm, did they see what they thought they saw? Her telling. But this one, and I got this from the Confessionals podcast. Thank you. Thank you to whomever wrote this. This was written last year. Um, They've gathered some things as well, and they've got some of their own accounts. So um, this guy, which I thought was really kind of terrifying, he says um, he used to live in Texas. Um, Being a runner, he would often seek out wooded paths to run on because Texas is hot as fuck. He doesn't say that. I do. I would run in the woods, too. Um, One summer day... So it's hot. On a Friday, he went for a run in the evening at around 6 p.m. through a local park with a paved path through the woods. So paved path. Hard to get lost on a paved path. Um, The wind started picking up and a storm was approaching, but I thought I could finish my run before the rain hit. And then I woke up. I was it was the middle of the night and I was stumbling around off the trail in the woods. So he went from just running to being lost in the woods. Yeah, that's weird. No blip in the middle. He spent, he says he spent like what felt like forever crawling around because he was so tired and dizzy trying to find something to drink and slake his thirst. Not finding anything, he vaguely recalled eating snails and insects to try to get some moisture. I guess you get desperate and you're kind of out of your head. Eventually, he managed to find his way back to the path where somebody saw him and called for help because obviously if you're bad enough that you're eating snails, you're in bad shape. Um, and found out that he'd been missing for two nights. So it was now Monday. So he remembers nothing. Nothing. That's less <laughs> of a, sty- a time slip than maybe a glitch in the Matrix. Um, <laughs> um, so this lady, um, and she doesn't give a name. It says just says two women. Um, this lady and her stepdaughter were crossing a busy street with many lanes, which seems like a bad idea to me. Um as they entered the final lane before reaching the other side, they realized that they were going to hit, get hit by a car. But instead of the car hitting them, they both wound up on the other side of the road. Again, that's a glitch in the Matrix. So kind of sounds like the glitches. Yeah. Let me grab this one for you. So there's a famous picture. I don't know if you've seen it online. But there's a crowd of people. It's the 1940s. You have all of these. Well, not all of the gentlemen in the crowd, but... The vast majority of people in the crowd are, they're wearing their dapper little hats and they've got their suits on and it's, it's very charming. And among them is a guy wearing sunglasses and a zip front hoodie with a screen printed (laughs) t-shirt. And while I'm sure that there's a really logical explanation for it, to me, this looks like any guy you'd see down the street. Yep. And so uh, apparently the the picture the picture is reportedly taken in 1941. Um and people say his appearance has been de- debunked because the shirt is in fact a sports sweater. Um and the glasses sunglasses like that were sold in the 1920s. So it's possible that he's wearing 21-year-old sunglasses. Um and he's wearing a sweater 
from a sports team. But if you take a really good look at the hoodie that he's wearing, that doesn't look like anything I've ever seen in a 1940s picture. And um, I don't recall them having access to fleece back then, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? So another one is in 1957, three naval cadets on a map reading exercise appeared to stumble across a deserted medieval village in Suffolk. But when they went back, it was gone. Yeah. Mm, depends on the village. If it's like a temporary thing for some cosplay shit, and then they pack it all up. Yeah. But they're usually pretty obviously yeah, that, fake. Well, so. medieval buildings were quite a bit more stout than what yeah, weekend have cosplayers buildings. would be. They'd have like tents and yeah. shit like that. So... There's also another story about a pilot who was flying over an abandoned airfield and he saw airplanes and people in, you know, the, the flight suits that the flight crews wear, um, busily working away on the airfield. But he knew from his own personal experience that the airfield hadn't been used in more than a decade and had been completely abandoned. And when he got back, he reported it to his CEO and they said, no, 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 there's nothing there. A second flight of the area showed him that no, there was grass growing on the runways. There was there was no way that what he had seen was possible. A few years later, they repurposed the airfield because of the war, and the planes that he had seen and the style of uniform that he had seen were now present in modern rotation. And so, several years after his initial sighting, he flew over the airstrip and saw exactly the same thing. But this time he expected to see it there because he knew that there would be people there. So, you know, his 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 interpretation was that maybe he got a peek ahead in time. A few sounds, years. Sounds like correct somewhat. Well, and that's what I wonder. You know how I feel about um, the potential for um, alternate universes. Yes. It's the one outlandish theory that you don't believe, which just drives me crazy. <laughs> but if you consider the potential that we have, that every decision that we make creates a potential other reality, all of those realities crowded together, it, I mean, is it possible that we can see from one to another occasionally? Einstein's theory and other cosmologist theory um in the way that time works we view time because we're in it because you're in the middle of it you view it as a linear thing so time is moving forward but if they're correct and time wraps in back in on itself isn't there the potential that we could possibly see one of those loops that's parallel to where we are in the time stream well in the modern day you would think somebody would have got it on camera you know, you would think to so. To prove it. Then there's Bigfoot and UFOs, and yet nobody can get any fucking pictures that clearly have hardly anything, so. Well, and that's the thing. Is that because they don't exist? I mean, when we when we watch the news and you consider that people can't even freaking get... I mean, when somebody robs a bank and you can't even see his face, do you think we're going to be able to videotape ufos and bigfoot honestly think somebody would by now one would think but here we are so there are several photos that purport to catch people who are time travelers so whether this is a matter of somebody accidentally stepping out of their own time or somebody deliberately propelling themselves to another point in time um it's difficult to say but that might answer your question. So one of my favorites, and I'll show you these images as they come up. So one of these is from the 1962 World Cup. As the Brazilian team is lifting the trophy, if you look closely at the bottom center of the image, it looks like somebody holding up a cell phone to take a picture of the guy with, with the cup. And it's possible that it's 1962. Maybe they're holding a recorder. Maybe because they've got their hand kind of over it, it's difficult to see what it is. 
Oh, wait, I'm looking at the wrong person. Yeah, we saw that one TV show, and I showed this lady in a different time talking on a cell phone. Yeah. Well, this one, it does look like they're holding a flip phone at this guy's junk, and I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Maybe she, he's impressed by his bulge. <laughs> no, that's definitely not it. <laughs> um, what are you saying? Honey? <laughs> I'm saying I can see the picture, and you can't. Okay, <laughs> so... Um, there's another one, um, an image from 1905 that I'll show you that includes all sorts of interesting people. It's at the docks, um, and it looks like it's in New York City. So if you look near the edge of the boat, there's a guy with a mohawk, which they cite as evidence of a time traveler. No, yeah, that's bullshit. I say... Lots of guys did mohawks. It, mohawks tattoos. Doing the look at me stuff. shit, you know. Well, and, you know, people have wanted to express themselves in different ways since yeah, the beginning of time. Yeah, doing, doing mohawks. I mean, shit, you know, the Indians did it way before they did. So it's not like it wasn't in existence. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of where we saw. Um, oh, a cell phone, if... that's a different story. <laughs> Well, and there's, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a ton of them out there where you have um, images of people who don't appear to fit in. So there's a, there's a photo f of a little boy at the Gettysburg Address, and he's not the subject of the photo. They're trying to get Lincoln, obviously. Um, but this little boy is, his clothing is almost right for the period, but his haircut is like a 1970s shag, which wouldn't have been common. In the 1860s? Yeah, but haircuts, I wouldn't put anything at a time. Well, not necessarily. But it's anecdotal evidence like that that make people believe that there's some potential that these sorts of things are happening. But one of my favorites was um, this guy. Uh, it was in the American Southwest, I want to say New Mexico. Um, and it's the 1960s and he's driving down the highway and he sees his vintage car. And you notice those things. It's, it's, those are, those are pretty cool. Most people will slow down and take a look. Um, but as he s does, as he slows down and takes a look at this car, the woman driving it is absolutely petrified, like terrified to see him. And, um, he motions for her, you know, pull over. If there's a problem, I can help you. Um, and she does and he pulls in front of her and when he turns around, she's gone. There's nobody there. And so the question is, was he hallucinating? Did he see a ghost? Or did this woman slip out of her own time? And can you imagine how terrifying it must have been for her to see this, you know, car that was out of time and this guy that's like waving at her and she doesn't know what to do? Yeah, that would be fucked up. I wouldn't have fucking pulled over. I'd have gunned it. <laughs> Catch me. You want something from me? But um, so yeah, that's um, that's time slips. It's cool, it's, weird. It's it's cool, and if you want, I can I can gather some more interesting tales so that you can have some specifics. There's a lot of stories out there that have different versions, so you know that it's either a big game of telephone or it's a work of fiction. Um, but some people have made some really compelling stories. Have shared some really compelling stories of events um i've read many times about people who were walking down the street and they're in a town that they were in and suddenly the noise of modern life is gone and things are quieter sounds are more muffled people's clothes don't fit in the shops are different and um those are the stories that that interest me so is this something that happens and if so how well, if your looping thing is true, then that's what would happen. My looping thing? Yeah, the time loop. <laughs> oh, I know what you meant. I just thought it was a funny way to put it. Loopy. loopy. Are you saying I'm loopy? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and on that fine note, everybody, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Let us know if there's something that you'd like to hear about. I'd love to do some research. Like us. Follow us. Follow us. <laughs> See you next week. Follow Bye. the weird as fuck. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Shh. Shh. <laughs>
Want to stay connected between shows? You can find us on Instagram at Weird as FCK Podcast, on Twitter at Weird as Fuck Pod One, on Facebook at Weird as FCK Podcast. Send us an email at Weird as FCK Podcast at gmail.com or come on over to our website at www.weirdasfck.com. There you can check out our blog, pick up some merch, look over our sources and even share your weird experiences. You might even make it on a future episode. We would love to hear from you. Until then, tune in and keep it weird.